What was your mom's um, quote about the revenue stream? <laughs> so, so uh, she was here visiting, and uh, it wasn't too long after we had got the first two properties, and I told her, you know, my, I had two, only two regrets in life, and I truly only had two regrets in life. One of them is that I never joined the military. My father was in the military, but I, I didn't do that. And the second one was that, uh, you know, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I said, well, you know, I can't ever do anything about the military. I'm too old now. They wouldn't even take me if I wanted to go in. But I said, look, we've got these cabins now, and I'm now an entrepreneur. I'm, a, I'm, I'm like entrepreneur, that. Yeah. And she said, eh, kind of. She said, not really. I said, huh? And she said, well, you're not relying on that as your only source of income because that's what she and my father did all those years. She said, you still have a job. And I said, ah, you got me. <laughs> so uh, so, mom, I don't have a job anymore. This is it. This is my this is only source of income. Hi, my name is Matt Landau. I'm the founder of VRMB and The Inner Circle, the most independent group of vacation rental professionals online. And this is Unlocked the Tiny Architects edition, in which we travel to meet some of my contemporaries in their element and find out what makes them so special. This is Unlocked. My name's Matt Landau, and this is Unhooked. I mean Unlocked. <laughs> you like what I did there? I do like it. I do like it. This is the d the DNE landing version of Unlocked. It's called Unhooked. David Krauthammer and his wife Edna are the owners of D&E Landing, which, as far as I know, is the only fishing-specific vacation rental fleet in the United States. It's located on Lake Guntersville, which is one of the most famous bass fishing destinations. And when David invited me to go fishing with him, I took the bait. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm great. Who are you? I am David Krauthammer. Krauthammer, that sounds like a nice Jewish boy. That, that's exactly right. And you are the official owner and creator of this wonderful vacation rental business in which we're sitting? That is correct. And what is the name Myself of this property? And my wife. And how do you, what is the name of this property and what is your guys's, um, what does the whole business look like beyond just this one? So the, the name of the business is D&E Landing. And it, and my wife Edna came up with it. It stands for David and Edna, so very creative. Uh, the uh, this particular place we're sitting right now is our, our flagship, if you will, uh, Breezeway Bay. It's the name of it, and it's our uh, owned property that's on the water with a boathouse. It is most certainly only what twenty meters away from the water. About yeah. where we're sitting right now. Very close. Very Beautiful close. dining room area, and this property has how many bedrooms? Uh, three bedrooms and a loft, so basically four. And it fits into your greater portfolio. There's other properties. There well. is. There is. We have a total of eight, five owned, three managed. And they're all relatively close by? They are, yeah. They're, uh, they're fi our five are right here, this one and four across the street. And we have two managed that are up the street about six miles. And then we have one down in Guntersville that is about uh, 12 miles. And when I talk about limited edition vacation rental businesses, the ones that have cornered a niche that is not really replicable or maybe even scalable, you have cornered a particular niche. And as you may have guessed from my cheeky introduction, it's fishing. Absolutely. Tell me about your main target clientele. Uh, our main uh, guest avatar is fishermen. Uh, well over 90% of our guests come here to fish because uh, Gunnersville Lake is one of the top bass fishing destinations in the country. Uh, we are proud of that and uh, really enjoy it. But uh, yes, the vast majority of our guests are fishermen, as am I, so I do understand our guest very well. You are your guest, effectively. Effectively. And That's we right. went fishing this morning, didn't we? We did. It was not planted or anything, but you caught a brilliant bass. She was beautiful. A couple caught pounds. pounds. Um, you and I have known each other for how long now? Uh, it's been several years now. Uh, First virtual friends. 
Correct. We were virtually dating. Correct. And now right. we are actual, we, we, we have met each other in person a number of times. That's right. Is it two times only? This is. This second. is the second time. Yeah. And we were going to meet at Heather's conference. That's right. This year, but it got postponed to next year. So you'll be there next year. I will be there next year, and I will be uh, coming to New Orleans at some point. You better. Come, <laughs> and, come and do some fishing next trip. just outside of New Orleans. Um, and I've known you all these years, but I've never actually got a chance to really sit down and peel back the layers on what makes you so fascinating to me. Um, and I'd like to start, quite simply, with um, where you're originally from, and then move into a little bit about what you did professionally in your early days, let's okay. say. You're originally from where? I grew up outside of Boston in a city called Brookline. Brookline. Yeah. And how many people were living in that household? Uh, there were four of us. There was my parents and my sister and myself. Okay. And how was that childhood? Nice? Oh, great. Yeah, absolutely great. Classic. Very. Did you go fishing? A lot. Where? Uh, there were several lakes that were, well, they, they call them reservoirs up there, that were within bike distance of the house. So I would ride my bike over uh, at least several times a week. Get a little taste for fishing in your early years. That's right. That's right. And do you associate with yourself as someone from that part of the world for a long time? Or did you eventually move somewhere new and call find a new home? Yeah, I've been gone from there longer than I live there now at this point in my life. So now I really associate myself more as a southern down here yes you've got almost a little twang yeah almost, you, almost. i had the heavy boston accent when i first moved away from there but and where was, when time. was that uh well that was 33 or so years ago and where were you where did you move to i lived in florida for a year and then i came to alabama to finish school at auburn very good and what were you studying uh marketing Okay. Yeah. Now I understand why you have some of those genius marketing <laughs> principles built into everything that you do. Um, and did you go right out into the world and start working in marketing? Uh, I didn't. I went right out of the world and start uh, slinging auto parts across a counter. How did that? How did that happen? Was it just like an opportunity that presented itself, and you were like, "I'm in"? Well, um, my I grew up since I was a uh, little baby around cars and car repair and auto parts. That's what my father did. When I was uh, growing up, he had service stations when people would take their vehicles to a service station to get them repaired. And so it was in my blood. And uh, I started working at AutoZone right out of college as an assistant manager in a store. Was that because you loved car parts? Uh, it was because I loved them and there was a job available and I just graduated and it was time to make some money. And that was in Alabama? That was in Alabama. That was in the in next town over. Okay. And you started doing well at your job? I did. Apparently. You're, that's, the, that's like the legendary <laughs> right, history. Right. You were good at it? I was good at it. I was very good. I uh, uh, enjoyed it. And so I was a store manager for a couple of stores. I was a district manager in a couple of places. And then ultimately uh, went to Memphis to the corporate office for 20 years. Wow. So you were at corporate auto, what is it, auto zone or auto, auto parts? Zone. Auto, zone, auto zone. Which, what, owns auto parts? Uh, well, they distribute auto parts. They oh. sell auto parts. Why am I thinking the name of a car part business is called auto parts? Is it not? Um, Let's make that up. I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you were there <laughs> in corporate headquarters for 20 years. 20 years. What were you like most proud of about that time? What accomplishment? Um, building teams. Uh, I, I had several different roles in the in management position with uh, you know several different uh, numbers of folks and building some teams that, that did very well and did a lot of good things for customers. And you... 20 years is a long time to work at a company. Um, well, I was 26 in total. 26? Yeah, 26 in total. So what in the end put a halt to that? Uh, Alabama and vacation rentals. <laughs> they reared they their ugly head. They did. And so wait, how did that go down? Uh, so in uh, 2013... Uh, we purchased uh, two uh, piece of property that had two vacation rentals on it. 
we already had a house in Guntersville that we knew we were going to retire to at some point down the road, another eight or 10 years. But uh, I told our real estate agent and friend to find me something else that when we did move, I would ultimately be able to do and, you know, have something to keep busy. And, and is that when you, re- when you retire, the original plan was? Right, okay. right. The original plan was when I would retire, and that was a good eight to ten years off. Well, she found a place very quickly for us. And this we, is Edna was searching, or this is the real estate agent? This is the real estate agent okay. that was searching. And why her Alabama? Name is, name is Julie. Uh, well, Edna's from Alabama, and early on, after we first got married, we've now been married 30 years, but... When we first got married, she said, you know, someday down the road when we retire, I want to live in Alabama. And I said, I'm, I'm good with that as long as I get to choose where. That's which, a fair. Which she was fine with. And so, you uh, liked Guntersville because of the fishing. Well, I like it because of the fishing and the lake, but her very best friend in the world lives only about 30 minutes away. And she's more like a sister than a friend, so... I knew she wouldn't have a problem moving here. And were you fishing all of these corporate years? Did you ever get a chance to go fishing? And Yes. Yeah. There, uh, we were outside of Memphis, and so there's no good lakes right there. But within a couple of hours, there are several good lakes. So. And that was yes. in your off time. Right. Vacation right. time, which was, I'm guessing, not plentiful. No. Not tremendously. No, more on the weekend and that kind of thing. But you were more or less content in this job at, at the headquarters. Mm-hmm. I was. And this idea about finding new property in Alabama where you guys would eventually move upon retirement was accelerated. Very much so. What, what, what was the... It was the, a specific property that changed it all or what? It was Edna. That changed it. <laughs> what, she, what was well, her argument? We, we, uh, we had been operating the two that we had bought and working on a third on the same property to get it ready for about six months. Uh, We bought them in August and in uh, February, she looked at me one day and she sat me down and she said, you need to sit down. And I said, okay. And she said, you got two choices. We're either gonna live here or we're gonna live there. But we can't keep going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. How often were you going back and forth at the time? Uh, Well, pretty much every weekend because we were still trying to do a lot of the cleaning and the maintenance ourselves. So this was, these properties were already vacation rentals? They were pseudo vacation rentals. They weren't a business, but uh, the owners would, previous owners would live in one and they'd rent the other one out some to overflow for some of the true vacation rentals in the area. And so you so, were going back and forth to take care of these properties? Yeah, at least two or three weekends a month and it was a four and a half hour drive and we would get home Sunday night between midnight and two o'clock in the morning and then have to get up and go to work the next day. So when she said, it's either here or there, I said, that's an easy decision. It's there. Let's go. And do you think you would have made that decision if the vacation rental thing wasn't like already planted as a seed in your brain? No. You would have just stuck I with would. It? I would just now be getting here sometime in the next three or four years. So that was the originally, that was the retirement plan. But that was now in hindsight eight years ago. That's right. You retired eight years early. Right. Yep. Right. And you move out here to Guntersville. And what does the business look like in its early days, DNE Landing? Uh, in its early days, it was it was all about you know growth mode and trying to make sure that we took care of our guests you know the very very best we could and get a lot of referral business. We. We never have done a lot of marketing. Uh, we've not done you know, a lot of Facebook advertising or anything like that every now and then. But uh, our business has grown organically, primarily through referral. And I want to touch on some of what I think is your genius in your referral marketing in a moment. Uh, but at the beginning, did you even have like the name of a business or a logo? Or was it just kind of a loose idea of a business no it was it was a loose idea of a business at at the very beginning and what was that first like step was it physically moving here was it actually getting a logo how did it turn no the logo came came quite a bit later um i did a website for us early on and and that kind of thing but um you know the first step after after purchasing the properties was to get the third one ready and and just to start getting the word out a little bit about DE. What I find to be most inspiring 
about David's background and the business that he's built for himself is in the power of niche marketing. David has not only built a profitable business that has a high percentage of repeat and very happy guests, but David also gets to do what he loves. He gets to hang out with fishermen and fish in his off time. It's the perfect lifestyle business for him, the perfect balance between work and semi-retirement. And from the very beginning, it was fisherman-specific vacation rentals? Yes. Never anything 100%. else? 100%. No. In hindsight, is that, was that a smart thing? Uh, that was a very smart thing, yes. That was a, it was a very good thing for us, and it allows us to focus specifically on the needs of that guest and make sure that you know, when they come, it's as perfect as it can be. And I'm guessing that is maybe not easier of a job, but more focused of a job than a vacation rental somewhere that has a number of different kinds of clients, people. Maybe some are coming for fishing, maybe some are coming for bachelor party, maybe some are coming for rest and relaxation. Having only one specific kind of clientele allows you to make decisions more easily, I'm guessing. It's a more focused style of business. Absolutely, there's no question about it. And I, I think you're probably right. I think in some senses it is easier because you just only have to focus on the one thing and make sure you that that you do it the best and if you can accomplish that then you, know, you will end up with a successful business do you think you did it by accident or was this sort of methodically done whether you're conscious were you conscious of these decisions or yeah i think a lot of the decisions a lot of the decisions i was conscious of uh, ultimately we were able to grow it initially we uh, by ourselves we didn't have any any ideas of managing other people's properties but um, we had the two when we bought it we finished the third one uh, we built a fourth one on that same property so we have two acres with four cabins on it and then an opportunity came up across the street for this one we're sitting in now breezeway bay so we we jumped on that one because of the proximity and location uh, so that gave us our five and then uh, one of our very good guests who stayed with us for several years decided they wanted to buy a place down here, but they live in Kentucky. So they said, would you run it for us? And that was the first one that we managed. So we said, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it for you, no problem. So we did that. Then uh, we got a phone call from another, uh, another owner who was just around the corner from them. And... Uh, one of the real estate companies shut down their vacation rental uh, business here in Guntersville. So he had been with them, but he wasn't tremendously happy with what they had been doing for him anyway. So we, we took him on, and now he's doing very well. I think this is the way a lot of managers fall into it. They're either managing their own or managing one or two, then doing it really well, and all of a sudden people come knocking. Right, right. Yeah, that, I think that story has been told many times, even on your podcast. And we don't focus on businesses this early in the development too often on the podcast, but it's important to point out that the vast majority of people who get started in the vacation rental industry sort of fell into it accidentally. They couldn't afford a home in this particular case and found that hosting guests was a great revenue stream. And that brings us up to today. You've got um, what is approximate at an average occupancy that you're operating at? Uh, so we, depending on the, on the, the time of year, um, we, so year to date through June, we're at about 60% occupancy in, occupancy in total, but that includes January and February, which for us would be not low season, low, low season. So uh, if you take it between, uh, you know, the good season or the high season, it's anywhere between 76 and 88%. Not like anyone's counting. No, no, I'm not keeping track. <laughs> the fact that David's achieving these kinds of numbers in and of itself is incredible. But 
Perhaps a more important takeaway for every single vacation rental professional who's listening to this is that David knows all of these numbers. He's consciously tracking these numbers as his business grows, knowing what percentage of repeat stays, knowing what percentage of bookings are coming direct as opposed to OTAs. These are the gauges, the meters of your business that let you know you're on the right track. Um, and last night we were talking about your this golden ratio of direct bookings, whether they're people going to your website, people uh, repeats reaching back out, or referrals, people who know someone instead. Um, your direct bookings are quite high they are. in relation to your OTA bookings. Approximately, what's the breakdown there? 77%. Direct. That's correct. Which is to say, a lot of people really like their stay here and come back and or recommend it to friends. That is correct. What very, percentage, very if you were to guess, would be new versus repeat? Uh, new versus repeat right now is 60% uh, repeat, which That's is incredible. down a little bit from last year, but it's not down because we had fewer repeats. It's down because we we're getting some more new. And that took place over time, right? It wasn't like the first year you were in operation, you were doing 60% repeat. Oh, this no. is something you built up. Absolutely, 100%. You have, to, you have to build that up over time. And now is when I want to dig into your, your big learnings at AutoZone, which sounds like kind of became part of your hospitality philosophy, for lack of a better word. Um, was AutoZone all about customer service? Was that a huge component of their work? Absolutely. That is the number one thing at AutoZone is customer service. And is that different from other big stores like that? It is. Yeah, you, you generally don't get the love, the same level of customer service if you go into uh, another bricks and mortar store, not just auto parts. It could be, you know, it could be any type of a store, um, but you generally don't get the same level of service. And this is something that's built into the training, I'm guessing. It is from day one. It's fundamental. You're, you're indoctrinated and, uh, and you, you quote unquote drink the Kool-Aid. Right. It's good Kool-Aid. It's, yeah. it's, you know. Delicious. Very delicious, but uh, yes. And and if you don't do that, you won't make it there. I was about to say, like if someone doesn't get it, do they just get fired? They go away. One form or another, they go away. So like how, I mean, a lot of this customer service thing is not necessarily about following a template. It's more about making a judgment call when something falls outside of the, the process. How do they, how did they reward people for that kind of judgment because it's hard to measure isn't it it yes it is hard to measure and you have to be looking for it in others in order to identify it like so uh, so they would have an award called the extra miler award and they would give that to somebody would recommend another auto's owner for the extra mile award yes you have to nominate somebody or a manager might catch somebody doing something right. That's another catch for catch something, somebody doing something right. And uh, you would be nominated for this, and then they would give you a cash award for it, and you'd get a you know, plaque and that kind of thing. So recognition for that kind of yes. going above and beyond sort of thing. Right. You remember exactly. any good inst examples of someone doing something like special? Oh yeah, they have, they have examples every day of you know, somebody their battery died five miles down the road and you know somebody from the store would go bring a battery down there and replace it for them and then come back to the store and you know uh, it's, it's the thing of on and on it's the thing of commercials you know those are the kind of things that they make these inspiring customer service commercials about but you're saying they actually did that on a regular basis that happens every day <laughs> um and how, how talk to me about this um acronym that was used in, in, in corporate world that helped everybody remember how to implement this. Whittager. 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 How do you, what are the letters? It's what it takes to do the job right. That's what it stands for. W-I-T-T-D-T-G-J-R. Right. Whittager. Whittager. I think I had a teacher named Mrs. Whittager <laughs> back in middle school. What it takes to do the job right. Mm -hmm. How is that? Give me an example. So that was coined by the very first store manager uh, of AutoZone. His name was Doc Crane. And he coined that because he wanted to make sure that his employees 
gave the customers everything they needed, nothing more, nothing less. So his philosophy, and ultimately it became AutoZone's philosophy, that a customer should leave the store with everything they needed to do the job properly, whether they realized it or not when they walked in, but not anything that they didn't. So it's not go sell every dollar you can sell to them. It's just make sure they have everything they need. So it's a very customer first thing. Let's identify what the customer is trying to do. Maybe they're trying to fix a... Could be a brake job. A brake job. Um, identify what they're trying to do and then make sure they know all the things that are needed to do that job whether they were aware of them all or not help them do all that but never go beyond that and try to sell them something that they did not need that's right that's a pretty simple but brilliant way of looking at clients it is and it's easy to implement it's easy to understand and it works really well so like a brake job, I'm guessing, I have absolutely no idea how to do a brake job, but <laughs> I'm guessing there's some things, there's like a, a bunch of different pieces you need and maybe someone doesn't remember that they're going to also need the pads or something. Yeah, that's right. Did I just totally embarrass myself? No, no, you didn't. They do need pads. You okay. can't do a brake job without pads. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that wittiger is something that's taught from the very beginning as a fundamental. Mm-hmm. And these people kind of, employees use it to service, guests, customers. Right. Um, is that something that you began kind of applying to d and Landing when you started working the hospitality side of this industry? For sure, yep. Yeah, you can, you know, it, it would be similar, but you could consider it, you know, uh, maybe an extreme level of customer service for our guests, something, you know, doing things that somebody else is not likely to do for them if they need it. I'm not going to push anything on them that they may or may not want or need, but if they need it and they're here, it will happen. And maybe even, like I'm trying to apply the idea of upselling, which is fairly common in hospitality. Um, you know, you, someone books a hotel room and then they encourage you to book a fishing tour, for instance. Um, applying the Wittiger to, to vacation rentals, maybe it's just what they very well may like for a complete vacation and nothing that they would not that they don't need Mm -hmm. in a sense Mm -hmm. Um, so you find yourself doing kind of applying this on a regular basis give me an example Uh, the the one about the guys who arrived uh, with the flat tire I think is a good example okay sure yeah absolutely we uh, we had some very good guests they've been staying with us for several years and it wouldn't matter if they were a good guest or not but they happen to be and he came and had a trailer tire flat on the way down so he used a spare and he put it on his trailer. And when he, I met them when they arrived and he said, yeah, I had a flat tire, blah, blah. I said, okay, well, give it to me. And he said, huh? And I said, well, I opened up the back of my truck and I said, put it in the back of my truck. I'll go tomorrow and I will get it repaired or I'll get it replaced and then I will bring it back to you. And, you know, yeah, our folks, our guests, our folks, they come here for one reason. They come here to fish. 95 plus percent of them come here to fish. They didn't come to go spend the morning at a tire shop replacing a tire or getting it fixed. So I think that is my job to do that for them and make sure that they can get out on the lake at daylight and do what they came here to do. What it takes to make the vacation right. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Were they surprised when you said, I'll take this and go get the tire fixed while you guys get out on the water? They, a little bit, I mean, they were appreciative. Uh They weren't as surprised as maybe somebody new to us would be because they've stayed with us many times and they know if they need it, I'm going to make it happen for them. So, you know, they were, they were very, very glad and happy, but probably not as surprised as somebody else might have been. And I'm guessing that, I mean, this, this has a cost. You driving here, getting the tire, getting it fixed, bringing it back. It's your time. It's whatever money to cost. I'm guessing this has a return on that investment in your brain. Oh, absolutely. What is the return? Well, the return is the fact that if they, if anybody mentions to them, you know, down the road uh, that I'm going to be going to Fish Gunnersville Lake, that they're going to say, here you go, you know, here's this guy's card and you need to call this guy or or whatever the case may be. Um, And they'll get the same level of service as, you know, these guests did when they arrived. So... The, the referring guests can be confident that 
if they're going to send somebody to us that they're going, you know, those folks are going to be happy. Um, I would, you know, you don't want to start promoting yourself as the vacation rental guy who will do anything you possibly <laughs> need. But at the same time, it sounds like that's kind of a key. I mean, it's not something you, you advertise. Right. But right. it's something that makes this repeat guest number so high. Um, it has a value, I think, in that the cost of acquiring a new lead is always exponentially greater than a repeat. Absolutely. And so maybe if you're Absolutely. comparing the amount that you invested in that tire, for instance, to the amount that it would cost to get that guest's next stay from an OTA, let's say, or advertise somewhere in the newspaper, mm -hmm. it's actually not that expensive. No, it's not. And it's also building up this kind of karma and goodwill and and um, sort of admiration in the, in the eyes of your guests. Right, right. And we do the same thing when it comes to the managed properties as well. You know, we'll do light maintenance for them and something's broken, replace it or fix it or those kind of things. Now, do you think that it's possible that to be too generous, too nice? I do. but Too lenient? Um, and, it, you know, at times it'll, it'll, it'll get me. But at the end <laughs> of the day... <laughs> What's an example of a time that it gets, it gets you? Um, more so on on like uh, not requiring a deposit necessarily requiring a deposit at the time of booking. So I may include an address where they, somebody can send a check, you know, for the deposit, uh, but go ahead and make the reservation for them. And there's been a few times when the deposit never came, and for whatever reason the you know the uh, reservation didn't happen. And but. Uh, you just had someone call the other night, right? I did. That's why you're sitting here right now. Oh, they were, that person was going to stay in this property? They were going they, to. You were expecting their arrival, and there was no response from the text message or the email, so you called them, and you were told that, oh, we, we thought we canceled that. We're not right. coming. Right, right, yeah. And in this case, they didn't pay anything up front. You didn't have their credit card. No, they so didn't. You were you got, you got penalized. I did. But, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, most of our guests... You know, the vast majority of our guests appreciate the fact that they can mail a check in later or, you know, if for some reason they forget to do it, their reservation's not canceled and it's still available and it's still in force. So I think that, you know, the, the positive far outweighs the negative. This is Sean Miller, the president of Point Central. As a sponsor of the podcast, and also as a person who recently beat Matt in a one-on-one -on -one basketball game, we have the opportunity to interview Matt and this season's podcast. While well, we're gonna save the full interview for the end of the season, right now we're gonna share a small tidbit with you. Enjoy. What's your favorite story that's come out of VRMB since you started it? Oh my gosh. If you imagine how many great stories come out of every property management business and then multiply that by <laughs> 850, uh, not to mention just VRB subscribers like above 10,000, I have lots of really great stories. Um, for me, the most poignant ones are the ones in which the vacation rental business um, sort of transcended business and somehow changed someone's life. Um, so there's the story of the individuals who used vacation rentals to get out of debt. There's the story of vacation rent uh, managers who um, took over the family home after their mother had passed to keep her legacy alive. Um, the vacation rental business that plays an important role in its community. Uh, these are the kinds of stories that when I read them, and I receive lots of them, I, when I read them, I really uh, just, it's... It's remarkable, and I think that's what the power of this industry has is, is its ability to um, change people's lives and communities, mm. and I think that's a really exciting thing. All right, enough interviewing me. If you want to learn more about Point Central, head over to pointcentral.com slash VRMB. You can sign up for a free demo, get free HVAC analytics, and Sean's team takes incredibly good care of people. Now let's get back to the show. A lot of people are going to be listening to this. 
Uh, I want to actually touch on one thing before I get into this. Uh, how many employees operate under the umbrella of DNE Landing? Three. And who are they? That would be me, David. That would be my wife, Edna, and our daughter, Amber. And how, what are the roles and responsibilities there? Uh, I do everything tech-wise and do a lot of the property maintenance and uh, Edna will do any of the you know decorating and, and inside type stuff. Uh, Amber does the majority of the cleaning and then we'll help her you know when necessary if it's uh, get two or three or four back-to-backs in a day or whatever the case may be. And Amber was not always your cleaning uh, reliable cleaning person, right? She was not. She is the she is the third employee. It was just Edna and I up until last April. Not this last one, but the one before. So. And was that walk me through that decision to hire someone outside of yourself? Uh, it was. It was. Even though with our daughter, it was still tough. I mean, I'm kind of a control freak, and Edna is too. Uh, when it, particularly when it comes to the uh, cleanliness of our places. And that's one of the major reasons why we have such a high repeat business is that there is no place in the area that's cleaner than ours uh, for somebody to stay. So uh, even though sometimes it's just a bunch of fishermen, they still appreciate the fact that they walk in and everything is where it's supposed to be and they can find everything. and. You know, cabinets are labeled and light switches are labeled and it's easy to navigate and it's clean. And you were doing all these things yourself, but you eventually decide we may want to experiment and bring, some, bring in Amber to test out the waters, so to say. Of the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's and, fair. That's and fair. I think a lot of people are in that position and nervous to relinquish any control because they fear the, the quality will drop. Absolutely. And maybe the quality does drop a little bit, but is what I'm hearing it was a necessary or at least a beneficial trade-off? Oh, it was definitely a beneficial trade-off. And even if even if it slipped just a little bit, it was it was to the extreme before when it was just Edna and I doing it. So even even if it slips just a little, uh, guests are still blown away by that level of. Uh, service and cleanliness so it's still quite good and that's just a priority within this business customer service right. cleanliness are there is there any other big pillars of it or is that kind of encompass the main differentiators here uh, I think that's the main differentiators from from our perspective um, I think if you go to different places uh, different cities different VRs different guests then you know things will change and they'll be different for those businesses. But for our business and for what our guests uh, need and expect, I think those are probably two of the big ones. And you're still doing a, a large amount of manual labor. I drove in here yesterday and you were mowing the lawn. That's right. And this is just one of your many duties. That's right. Talk to me about your vision of what this business is supposed to be and how you use that final vision to make decisions about what you are going to do day to day. So uh, I think we've touched a little bit on what I think it should be, but um, I think the guest deserves everything that they could possibly need to have happen while they're at a place. This is, this is their vacation for most of them. This may be their only one week of vacation for a whole year and if that does not go well you know it, it's just it's not right it, it can't be that way it has to go well so um, when we make decisions on uh, you know what we might purchase for a property or uh, how we might uh, add accessories for a property or what we might do to one uh, you know, do we need to replace beds? What needs to, you know, there, there's always something being replaced. It's furniture, it's beds, it's, you know, this needs to be upgraded, that needs to be changed, that kind of thing. Uh, we always keep that in mind and we always try and make sure that at the end of the day, it's going to benefit our guests. And if, if you didn't do those things, what do you think would happen? Uh, 
the the ramp up to where we are today was over years and it would probably take years but in two or three or four there you know there would not be a sustainable business we would we wouldn't have a business that we can uh, live off of and so uh, there's no question and when a lot of people define their dream business uh, it does may not include cleaning it may not include cutting the grass this this big picture here of what DNE landing looks like on paper, is it close to what you had envisioned, or is it veered totally off the path? Uh, for me, the yes, it's it's. I've I have since I was very small wanted to be an entrepreneur. I've had that burning desire. Um, to me, an entrepreneur does whatever they need to do to be successful and to take care of the people that are taking care of them, which in this case is our guests. So as I was growing up, you know, my father was, was, was always an entrepreneur. He always had his own business. He always ran his own business, nobody else. He didn't have a manager, he didn't have a, you know, he was it. It was him and one or two or three other people. In most cases, they were family members, an uncle, you know, a cousin, that kind of thing. Sounding very familiar. Sounding very familiar. Um, and, you know, that's, that's how I grew up. So uh, I feel like you have to be very hands-on uh, as an entrepreneur. But absolutely, there's, there's 50 different ways to be an entrepreneur. And some people are very hands-off. And they want to manage, you know, other people to make things happen. And, and they're extremely successful as, as well. So... Uh, I think it's just whatever works for you and the you know level of uh, of work that you want to do personally. Would it be fair to suggest to anyone who's entering the business anew or anyone who hasn't done this exercise yet to really sit down and draw out what the thing is supposed to look like in your eyes on paper and then make those steps towards it? The reason I ask that is because I feel like a lot of people, if they don't do that or if they have not done it recently they get either lost or burnt out. I, w I would definitely think they, that, that they should do that. And that will happen if you're not careful. Even if you're working towards your ultimate goal, it can still happen if you're not careful. But if somebody who doesn't want to be as hands-on as we are uh, starts down that path, they'll be miserable. So, yes, I think it would be a great idea to sit down, like you said, map it out. This is the direction and the course that I think I'd like for this business to go. And then you know you'll be able to figure out what you need to do to make it happen. And how many, for instance, that could be a, a quantity, like a number of properties, for mm -hmm. instance. And yep. out of curiosity, how many properties do you envision in your flotilla? eventually in the big picture here we have eight i would not go past 11 or 12 as a maximum um, we don't have any desire to be you know a big bad uh, management company a <laughs> big bad i like that underline the word bad um but you also have less tangible things that you're not willing to compromise on or that you would envision as the gold standard things like the way you take care of people the um the, the way you see you make these decisions, uh, the the guy who asks for um, soap, soap on his first night, so you don't <laughs> offer soap in the bathrooms, right? Right, That's because correct. it's it's not um, part of the. Well, everybody, you know, we did at first, but everybody likes something different. You you wouldn't think soap is a personal thing, but it kind of is, and so you can't really have one that's going to work for everybody. So we decided. Not to, but we, we've had multiple times when somebody has arrived and either they forgot to pack it or they didn't realize they needed it or whatever the case may be. And I'll, I'll always tell them, just give me a few minutes and I'll run up the street and get them a couple of bars of soap and bring it back. That's when I would, as the guests, feel terrible. It's like, no, 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 I can go get it. <laughs> I swear, I didn't mean to make you go get it. But you just show up with the soap. Well, sometimes, you know, they might have made a very long drive it's the end of the day, they're tired. All they want to do is go take a shower and get in bed so that they can get up really early and go fishing in the morning. But, but <laughs> along the lines of these doing like exceeding expectations, is it not dangerous to just do anything and everything in order to 
satisfy these people? Do you not create, um, what is the Sally's phrase? Uh, impossibly spoiled guests. Are you not creating impossibly spoiled guests? I am the king of creating impossibly <laughs> spoiled guests. He says with a gigantic smile on his face, folks. Why yes. do you do that? Uh, I think they deserve it. I just, I think they deserve it. They're, they're coming here. Like I said, they're, they're spending their money. They're coming for their vacation. And I think they deserve everything that we can possibly give them. And is there not a line that you, you don't cross? Do you not ever come across something that's like, wait a minute, I can't do that? Uh, I haven't found it yet. I'm not going to say there's not one, but I have not come across it yet. Because most vacation rental professionals got started accidentally, we end up doing all the tasks ourselves and eventually bake ourselves into the businesses to the point that our businesses depend on us alone. There's a couple ways that you can take yourself out of the business. One way, like David, is to put labels and instructions and manuals throughout the house to make your house more user-friendly so that you don't have to physically be there answering the questions. But another more extreme version is forcing yourself to take a break, choosing a couple days somewhere in the future and using the time from now until then to prepare. Perhaps that means reaching out to someone for cleaning. Maybe it's maintenance. Maybe it's a neighbor who will be taking care of the check-ins while you're gone. This is the kind of forced vacation that your business will thank you for in the end. Do you think that there is a little bit of your father in you? Oh, no, there's a whole lot of my father in me. Uh, I even look like him. Do you? <laughs> yeah. And you said you always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Do you view yourself as a vacation rental pioneer? I don't know. Not so much as a pioneer. I think I, you know, I, I'm proud of what we've built for sure. Uh, and and you know, it's still early in the life of the industry. But I don't know about being a pioneer. Well, my theory is that the pioneers don't recognize it in themselves in our industry. Um, that the magic of our industry that so many people come from totally different backgrounds bring with them some superpower that they learned in that previous life whether it was working uh, in medicine or at AutoZone or as a mother they bring with them something they fall into this business and then they build meaningful um, entities and that's a pretty a, a, a inspiring thing that's you you're a pioneer. I appreciate that. You are. <laughs> In that sense, maybe a little bit. But Do you never have people say to you, uh, say to you, wow, that's really incredible what you've built? Yeah, well, not, not, not some, a few people do every now and then. But, uh, but, you know. And you're enjoying it. Loving it. Loving it. Is that the, the big difference, the thing that gets you through the stress and the, the, the long nights is that you still really do love it and you are working for yourself? That's highly different from previous work stuff? Totally, yep, yeah, 100%. Yeah. This is um, something that anybody can do or only a few select people with the right mindset? It's something that anybody can do with the right mindset. I don't think it's a few select people and you can't do it if you don't have the right mindset. Which is the right mindset? The right mindset is that you're you are uh, cradling uh, your guests' vacation, whether it's two days or a week or a month, whatever it is. You're responsible for their enjoyment while they're at your place. And I think if you always keep that in the back of your mind, uh, that you will be successful. There are lots and lots of, of vacation rental owners and probably managers who don't necessarily keep that in the back of their mind and you know they look at either uh, revenue or profitability or uh, many other things before they look at the guest experience and I think if you uh, take care of the guest experience and you watch the other things then they'll come. It needs to be at the very top of your thoughts. It does. 
Whittager. Whittager. Um, I just wanted to thank you for um, not only, of course, your wonderful hospitality, taking me out fishing, even catching me, catching a fish for me, proving that there are indeed bass in that lake, uh, but also for your amazing work over the years and, and just putting your head down and doing what you are really good at, what you really love, and leading by example to that in that sense. To me, you are the perfect example of this industry's future. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. I just wanted to remind everyone that this episode was brought to you by Point Central, the home automation experts of our industry. You can head over to pointcentral.com slash VRMB, fill out the form, and take a free demo. You'll also get free HVAC analytics, and I can promise you that Sean's team will take great care. 